This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. As always, it's great to be with you all, especially on this Transfiguration Sunday. I tell you what, the best Bible stories always happen on mountains, don't they? (laughs) And today's story, the version of the Transfiguration from Matthew's Gospel, is no exception. I love that story. I think I love that story so much because I love mountains so much. And I love being on mountains, just like Jesus and the disciples are in this story. Some of you may remember that I'm a southern boy. I grew up in the Piedmont of Virginia. Uh, Literally, you can see a mountain from my backyard. My high school is at the foot of it. Uh, And it's a beautiful little mountain. It's called Carter Mountain. There's an apple orchard at the top. And often, especially when I was a child, uh, school classes would take a trip up there. Maybe my family would go up there in the fall and you could pick some apples and go to a nice wooden viewing platform and look out over this amazing vista and you could see the Blue Ridge trailing across the horizon and you could look down into the valley and see Charlottesville, the town where I grew up. And what I find so wonderful about being on a mountaintop like that is when you get up there, all the things that are normally so big and loud become pretty small and quiet. I remember going to the top of Carter Mountain and looking down at downtown Charlottesville and seeing an office building that towered over me when I was driving by it or walking by it. Now just a little toy of a building. The cars became specks. You couldn't even see the people. And all my responsibilities were down there in the valley and I I couldn't see them. I couldn't hear the noise. I couldn't feel the chaos that was waiting for me down there. It was delightful. Being on top of the mountain just felt restful, like an escape from everything. We used to go camping in the mountains, too, just a little bit farther west of where I grew up. In George Washington National Forest, my family would drive out in the van, take some tents and supplies, maybe some board games, and spend a week or so just being quiet together, going on hikes, swimming in a lake, avoiding technology, forgetting for a moment about all the craziness that was waiting for us back down the hill, down in the valley, down in the world. I love being in the mountains. And I hate having to leave them. I I hate having to go back down the mountain because when you go back down the mountain, the buildings get big again, the cars get loud again, your responsibilities come back, and you're not on vacation anymore. You're not on retreat anymore. You got to get back to work and things get scary. I don't like going back to the valley. I want to stay on the mountain. I think maybe that's why I love today's story so much. Because I think I relate to Peter. Peter wants to stay on the mountain. I mean, think about it. He goes up with James and John following his beloved teacher, Jesus, whom he has just acclaimed as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And they get to the top of this mountain, leaving for a moment everything behind. And Jesus shines out like the sun, dazzling. And Peter is just delighted. He says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. It's as if Peter is saying, this moment is so awesome. Can we just stay here? Let's just stay here. And it makes sense if you think about it. If you think about what's waiting for Peter once he goes back down the mountain. Once he goes back to the valley. Jesus has already started talking about how he must suffer and die. So I have to imagine that when Peter was thinking about what awaited him at the bottom of the mountain, he was thinking about a crowd of uncertain, hungry people. 
He was thinking about chaos and violence. Because at the bottom of that mountain was waiting for him the Roman Empire and its occupying forces. A world of uncertainty, doubt, and violence. And Peter knew the cross was waiting at the bottom of the mountain. Because after Jesus goes down the mountain, he continues his trek until he gets to Jerusalem and the judgment awaiting him there. In comparison with everything that's waiting for Peter at the bottom of the mountain, it sure seems like the top of the mountain is a pretty nice alternative. So he wants to stay. He wants to stay in the moment, stay where Jesus is shining like the sun. Can you blame him? I can't. I can't blame him at all. I relate to him. I want to stay where things are pretty and simple and clear. I want to stay where things are laid out for me, where Jesus is shining brightly and I can see him without a doubt in my mind. That's where I want to stay. I want to stay where the buildings and the cars are far off and small and the chaos is far away and my responsibilities aren't gnawing at me. I want to stay on the mountaintop. So does Peter. But here's the sad thing. We can't stay on the mountaintop. Peter can't stay on the mountaintop. Because he's following Jesus, and Jesus can't stay on the mountaintop. Jesus has got to go back down. Jesus has more work to do. Right after this story, what will happen? They go back down the mountain, they reach the crowd of people waiting for them, and Jesus has to heal a boy who has been afflicted by a demon. He gets right back to work in the mess of things, in the chaos, in the noise, amidst empire and oppression. Jesus gets back to work. He's got more healing to do. He's got more teaching to do. A bunch of his most famous discourses don't happen until after the transfiguration. He's got more prophesying to do. He has a last supper to share with his disciples. He has a cross to bear. Jesus has to go back down the mountain because he's not done working yet. And so Peter has to follow him. He has to leave the prettiness and the clarity of the mountaintop and go down into the valley. That sucks. (laughs) But it's where Jesus is going. And so it's where Peter has to go, where things are hard. I wonder, do you think maybe this church is kind of like a mountaintop? Do you see what I mean? For me, it feels like one. I find when I'm in these four walls of this sanctuary, the altar shining there, your face is smiling at me and my face smiling back. I often think with Peter, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let's stay here. Let's treasure this moment. Let's stay on the mountaintop. Because the valley is a lot more complicated than what's happening right here. This is pretty nice. Grace and hope are proclaimed. Everything's laid out for us. I don't want to go back down the mountain. I don't want to go where things get scary and violent. But just like Peter and just like Jesus, we can't stay here. Not even Father Joe and I can stay here. We have work to do. We can't stay in this room. We can't stay where it's clear and lovely and welcoming and nice. We have to go. We have to go back down the mountain. If we meet Jesus in this room, that's great. But we have to be equipped to follow him when he goes out that door. Because like I said, Jesus has more work to do. He has more healing to do. He has more teaching to do, more preaching, more prophesying, more suffering to do. And you know what? He's going to do a lot of that through us. So we can't stay on the mountain as nice as it is. We have to let the mountain fuel us and inspire us and equip us so that we can go down into the valley, go to the hard place, go to where things get scary and complicated and dark. That's where we have to go. We can't stay here, go out the door, 
Go where Jesus is going. Go where it's hard. The psalmist called the valley the valley of the shadow of death. That's where we have to go. That's where Jesus is going, and we're following him. And I don't really know what to say about that other than that if it's where Jesus is, then I have to believe it'll be okay, even if it's hard. I don't know what's waiting for you in the valley. I don't know what's waiting for you out those doors this morning. I don't know what brought you to the mountaintop, what you're trying to escape. Sooner or later, you'll have to confront it, just like I will. I have stuff waiting for me in the valley that I don't want to deal with. But I have to. I have to. That's where Jesus is going. And I follow him. It takes courage and strength to follow Jesus down into the valley. And we need help. As I was praying with the story of the transfiguration in preparing this sermon, um, I wrote a prayer in my journal, wrestling as I was with the, my own valley that I don't want to return to. And I just thought I'd read you the prayer that I wrote. Maybe it can be your prayer, too. Maybe it can be all of our prayer as we prepare to leave the beauty of the mountaintop and descend into a place where things aren't so clear and good. I'll speak for myself, Jesus. I want to join you on the mountain. I want to stay there in the clarity of your loving radiance. I want to go up, up really high so the buildings get really small and I can't hear the cars anymore and I can't see my apartment or my responsibilities or the violence of the world, all those problems that stir up the soup down there at the bottom in the valley. Valleys are the dregs. But that's where you go, Jesus. That's where you go. And I do not want to follow you there. Because it's scary down there. I want everything to be clear and it's murky down there. I want everything to be all set. But it's messy down there. And I want everything to be good. And Jesus, it gets really bad down there. So can you just promise me, Jesus... That if I do go down the mountain, you'll be there with me in the ruckus? Can you promise me that if I don't stay up here, then you won't either? Can you hold me when it gets scary? Can you love me when we're off the mountaintop? If I can't have the mountain, then I'll take your love. It's enough for me. In the valley, you're enough for me.